please, Andre, give me one minute to introduce you to our audience. Uh, Kalimera Kiris Kikiri Sinetri, in the almost in the Potsdam, uh, Verolino, Ekume Os Poski Klimeno Mobility, to Dr. Andre Barbeko, or to Perifimo GFZ. Το GFZ, για όσους δεν το γνωρίζουν, είναι το μεγαλύτερο γεωφυσικό κέντρο της Γερμανίας αλλά και της Ευρώπης, με περίπου 1.500 άτομα ε, προσωπικό. Ε, είναι ε, ένα Ινστιτούτο Κόλοσσος, το οποίο έχει ε, πειράματα και αισθητήρε, δίκτυα, όχι μόνο στην Ευρώπη, αλλά σε όλο τον κόσμο, στην Ανταρκτική, στην Χιλή, εννοείται και στην Ελλάδα, σε σμικά δίκτυα. Ε, η ομιλία του ε, δόκτωρα Μπαμπέικο, ε, βλέπετε στο τίτλο, είναι Real-Time GNSS for Rapid Rapture Inversion and its Implication for Tsunami Warning and Ground Shaking Prediction. Μας λέει λοιπόν πώς μπορούμε να εκμεταλλευτούμε ε, σε πραγματικό χρόνο καταγραφές από ε, GNSS, από GPS δηλαδή, ε, για να ε, καταλάβουμε σε πραγματικό χρόνο την διάρρηξη που γίνεται σε ένα σεισμό και αυτό να το εκμεταλλευτούμε για ε, γρήγορη, ε, έγκαιρη προειδοποίηση για τσουνάμι αλλά να το εκμεταλλευτούμε και για την ε, ε, πρόγνωση σε πραγματικό χρόνο της αναμενόμενης εδαφικής κίνησης λόγω του σεισμού. Uh, dear Andre, thank you very much again. The floor is yours. Thank you, Gerasimus. Uh, thank you for inviting me to make this presentation. I will try my best to make it interesting for you. So uh, let me share the screen. So please confirm that you can see my screen now. Confirmed. Okay. So uh, I will talk about the real time GNSS. GNSS stays for Global Navigation uh, Satellite System for Rapid Rapture Inversion. And uh, if we can rapidly invert the source parameters, the earthquake parameters, then we can immediately use it for applications like tsunami early warning or uh, ground shaking prediction. So uh, my talk is based on just the project we just finished. That was the three-year project funded by our Ministry of Education and Research. And uh, we had a chance to, uh, uh, to work together with a team uh, of our uh, colleagues and friends from INGV, from NOAA, and from uh, Indonesian uh, uh, Information Aerospatial Agency. Uh, so maybe I thought that I will uh, just go a little bit back and uh, like uh, start with some uh, background because this technique, this technology or the implementation of real-time GNSS for rapid source inversion is now coming to the operational phase in countries, for example, like Japan. But the background of this technology, the methodological development uh, goes back to the Sumatra earthquake. And that's, I would like to start from that time to give you some kind of the story of how the things started at that time. So everything, so basically started from 2004, this December, huge earthquake and tsunami in Indian Ocean. Sumatra earthquake, more than 200,000 people died because of this uh, huge uh, economic impact. And uh, the problem was that there was no early warning at that time in the Indian Ocean. And even uh, these earthquake parameters, they were not really recognized. Like the first information about the true size of the earthquake, about the true position of the rupture, about the length of the rupture, comes m m many, many days after the event. So it, basically the science technology at that time was not ready for that. And in uh, 2005, uh, you can see on the left side, there were two uh, publications 
uh, from uh, GNSS people, from GPS people who who used GNSS stations located on the uh, on the islands, Nicobar and Andaman islands, but also on the Sumatra uh, and in the Thailand uh, mainlands. Uh, these stations showed the significant uh, displacement, uh, cost seismic displacement. And that displacement was up to several centimeters and uh, like on the islands even more, which could be directly measured by the GPS stations. And that was used in a, like in a many months after the earthquake, that was used to uh, find the rupture, uh, slip distribution and the rupture size. And then, of course, that immediately there came an idea, if we can do it in a post-processing mode, uh, can we do it with real-time GNSS, like, uh, like on the fly? And uh, GEFT said, uh, like the institution in, in which I'm working, at that time was developing the tsunami early warning system for Indonesia, and we tried to uh, pursue this idea and uh, provided the methodological background, the uh, like the modeling, the uh, calculations. And on the right hand side, you, you see the two first papers, which were about that. The first one is like for uh, Jeffrey Blue et al, rapid determination of earthquake magnitude using GPS for early warning systems. And uh, our paper was uh, published in the same year towards real-time tsunami amplitude prediction, where we basically uh, just uh, consider this background. So on the next slide, I just want to show you very, very quickly what's going on. So what's the basic idea? So you can see the Sumatra, it's Indonesian island. Imagine we have earthquake with some epicenter. From this epicenter, the rupture could propagate to, to the south or to the north to the south or to the north so basically and that is a usual thing so basically the center doesn't immediately mean to the center of the rupture even this huge rupture in sumatra it was one side so rupture propagated from the epicenter to the north now imagine if we are in the very near field and we can model tsunami from the southern fault fault propagated to the south and the fault propagated to the north and you see, he, he, even from these two pictures, you see that the tsunami pattern would be very different. And he, if we look in the big city, Benkulu, like one million population, then the predicted tsunami wave heights are very, very drastically different. So in the northern fall, there is no tsunami. In case the fault rupture goes to the south, there is a huge tsunami. So basically, and um, we cannot distinguish it only from the classical seismic data about the point source position where the epicenter and magnitude because we're in the near field this uh, near field situation is typical of course not only for indonesia but also for greece uh, what can we do uh, if we look on the core seismic surface de deformation because the rupture is basically rupturing deep under the surface, but it also produced the elastic deformation everywhere and the media also on the surface. Then we see that the cost seismic deformation for these two cases is very different. It means if we can measure, if we, if we could have stations on the islands or on the mainland, and if we could measure these displacements, we could immediately distinguish between the two ruptures and use it for uh, early warning. So that uh, concept was developed like at that time. And uh, in, in, in 2007, we have uh, published a paper where we basically uh, to consider it methodologically and this numerically, uh, which magnitudes could be resolved with a fictive array of Genesis stations. So the ma magenta triangles here are the like a fictive array of the stations. And this is numerical study, and we and with a uh, colored uh, colored uh, rectangles, you can see the the magnitude of the resolvable earthquakes. So that uh, earthquakes even below magnitude seven could be resolved in a very fast time. 
Okay, so then uh, after 2007 up to Tohoku earthquake, there was silence. As usually tsunami, science is basically event-driven science. And then there was the next event, Tohoku. And, the, and again, the uh, pure seismic methods which were available at that time, they did not uh, provide the proper tsunami warning at that time. So you can see on the left-hand side the timing of the warning uh, provision by the GMA. GMA is a Japanese meteorological agency which is responsible for the tsunami early warning in Japan. So after three minutes, they were very fast. They uh, already uh, um, reported about the earthquake, but, the, but they assessed the magnitude as 7.9, which is basically a huge, huge underestimation. So they did major warning for the th uh, three uh, prefectures, but the rupture was m much, much larger. And uh, only almost one and a half hour later, the, the magnitude was upgraded to 8.4. In the like in the meantime, there was some warning provided by the Pacific Tsunami Warning Center. They used another technique, W-phase technique, which is capable to um, uh, recognize the higher magnitudes in a shorter time. But nevertheless, it, it works in the far field. And in order to be activated in the far field, you need to wait until the seismic waves would travel through the large distances. And that means time. So here it was like uh, 22 minutes. In case if you have Genesis stations and Japan uh, had a huge array, like more than 500 GNSS real-time stations at that time deployed on the island, these GNSS stations could record displacements immediately, like immediately, like uh, as the seismic wave uh, comes to the station, it can start recording it. And then in uh, our presentation, we made kind of a replay hint cast of this event and showed how it could work. And um, so basically, uh, so like, uh, Main advantages of GNSS uh, is clear. So uh, usually uh, the GNSS has no clipping, uh, no saturation. It can measure uh, measure very fast in the near field. It's gain of time. There is no need for like uh, complicated processing like double integration for uh, accelerometers. So and. Uh, what we did so at that time we basically we kind of um, replayed this event as if those observations were available at the warning center so then one could uh, one could make like a, 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 as a first step real time genesis processing with a ppp technique uh, that's very fast then if you could prepare everything for the source inversion, you can invert it very fast for the source. And then uh, tsunami impact from the source model could be estimated, for example, in linear approximations or using the Green's functions. That could be everything done very fast. And that, um, uh, uh, like if you, uh, yes, uh, and like uh, this picture you can see, the true observations from the GNSS stations in uh, Japan. So these are the time series. You can see that the core seismic offsets are very large, like uh, five meters, for example, on uh, on the station on the left. And uh, this uh, offset, of course, could be measured. And we can even start inverting, not waiting until the full rupture will envelop. Like, uh, uh, just imagine we are now at 90 seconds. So it's uh, the, the uh, dashed line on the left shows the uh, time position, like 90 seconds after the rupture starts. Yeah, we can already use these displacements, make source inversion, get the magnitude 8.7, like with the slip up to 40 meters, and uh, provide the prediction for the wave heights at the coast. Like, uh, and the rupture is still ongoing, so the earthquake is still running. 
uh, this uh, slide uh, shows uh, kind of the summary of this time development of the warning. So even if starting from one minute, of course, there is some processing time, but this processing time is less than one minute in the best case. We can already give some, uh, some uh, projection to the warning uh, perspective. And after three minutes, basically, the warning uh, perspective looks like the final one. Like if we compare the warning uh, perspective made after three minutes with the field observations, like they're also being converted in the colors used for the tsunami early warning, then there's basically almost no difference. So that again showed the potential of the operational implementation of the uh, real-time GNSS. And yes, indeed, uh, as you can see, like uh, from this uh, inlet, uh, after the Tohoku earthquake, there was a massive, uh, massive uh, progress in the application, also the operational uh, development of the algorithms. And the last one here is uh, called Regards. It's algorithm which is now being operationally implemented in uh, Japan for the tsunami early warning. Okay, so now coming to us, to Mediterranean case, where we don't have, most of, we don't expect like magnitude nine earthquakes. Uh, but we have kind of a lot of smaller earthquakes, like 7 to 7.5, and still there is a question. Of course, this uh, small earthquake has much, much less displacements. Like on the on the right hand side, you, you, you can see the three different uh, like ruptures with red is magnitude almost 9, green is magnitude 8.5, and 7.5 is just blue. And we see that there is the, the uh, displacement vectors, which could be trackable, they are very, very much smaller for the blue case, like for the typical Mediterranean case. So the question is still if the coastal Genesis network could see such small displacements and can we use them or can we use the dynamic waveforms as well? Because the dynamic amplitudes are larger than the static amplitudes, of course. So, uh, like in the previous time, like during the ha Hastarte project, which was almost uh, 10 years ago, we also made a, a methodological a numerical study for the Mediterranean costs. What we have done, we took all the possible faults, uh, like on the left hand side, you can see the crustal faults top and the subduction zone uh, faults on the law panel and we just like uh, activated virtual earthquakes along all these faults with different magnitudes up to the maximum magnitudes on these faults and going down and computed tsunamis and then uh, like uh, cut the minimum tsunamigenic magnitudes and asked ourselves in case of this minimum tsunamigenic magnitude, what would be the coastal displacements? Would be they large enough in order to track them or not? And the plot on the right shows, yes, yes, that in like in many cases, for example, in Greece, almost everywhere on the coast, these uh, minimum tsunami magnitudes should be detectable. So because the horizontal displacements would be more than five centimeters, uh, and that's above the accuracy of the modern real-time GNSS. So now I come in uh, to the project. So that was the project, as I mentioned, uh, called Evrica, run for the last three years with our partners in INGV and uh, in uh, NOAA. And we used their uh, stations uh, ring array in Italy, which has more than 200 sites with real-time data transmission. Uh, <clears throat> and uh, we just employed these stations in order to make a working prototype of the, uh, of the earthquake and GNSS assessment system and the eruption version. So the uh, project, uh, like the structure of the project was very linear. Work package one was uh, real-time processing of GNSS data and all this uh, seismic data uh, in order to 
retrieve co-seismic displacements. Then these uh, displacements were channeled into the work package too, what's about the source inversion. So we have displacements on input and we come with the source model as the output. And this uh, source model with uncertainties, it was like done in the Bayesian sense, was used for, gener for uh, calculation of the possible impacts like tsunami impact or uh, ground motion uh, prediction. We also planned landslides Accessibility, but they did not manage it because of the time, because of this COVID story, which like uh, hit us at that time. Yes, so just to end, uh, I will show you in a couple of slides, like uh, like this work package. Uh, work package one was about real time processing. You probably know that GFZ is also has kind of this uh, trademark is Geophone and SizeComp. It's a uh, seismic processing. Uh, systems and observation systems and uh, processing system, which basically takes uh, data from a bronze bait and uh, strong motion uh, sensors, which is here illustrated on the lower panel on the left side, and gives you the time series in the standard uh, mini seed, so called mini seed uh, format and of the uh, mini seed uh, technique. And uh, at the same time, uh, GFZ, there is also Department One at GFZ, which is uh, like uh, which is very good in this in the uh, real time GNSS process. And so, and we would like, and what we have done, we have extended this uh, size comp processing with uh, with the real time displacements from GNSS, which are being processed at uh, like GNSS uh, hard and software, and then streamed into the SizeComp, and there, uh, there was a plugin developed uh, by colleagues here at KFZ, and uh, currently the SizeComp is able also to stream out not only velocities and, uh, and accelerations in mini seed format, but also the displacements in mini seed format. Uh, that's one slide just to illustrate uh, the accuracy. Uh, so what we can see it here, the most important is this table on the right uh, and the numbers so, on the yellow fields. So basically, it's accuracy of the PPP processing, precise point position in real time with so-called regional augmentation. So the uh, northern RMS uh, uncertainty is like one centimeter. For east is also about one centimeter. Up accuracy is like three centimeters, and the TTFF is uh, time to first uh, fix. It's uh, twenty uh, seconds. It's important because if you have some uh, break or some satellites goes down, or you have to reconfigure your situation, that usually there is a lot of time is passed before the accuracy is reached. In that case, the, uh, this uh, time delay is only 20 seconds, so which makes this technique very nice for the real, for the hazard applications in early time. Okay, so the, uh, now we have these displacements streamed. And these displacements are a, a combination from GNSS, from also from uh, broadband and accelerometers. Now we can put them all into the source inversion, which is being done with the tool called um, Grond. It's a Pyroka suite, uh, Python suite developed at the uh, University of Potsdam and KFZ. And this is Bayesian inversion, which basically takes a, uh, a prior information about the seismicity in the Mediterranean region, about the faults, about the possible focal mechanisms. Then in case of earthquake, we have the parameters from uh, Geophone or from early EST about the position, about the magnitude. And then all, all these models then started to be treated, compare it with the synthetic observations, with observations, and you come with the rupture parameters in the sense of uh, not just one value, but it's, uh, it's like uh, how you can see here on the right side, you basically show the distribution, the pro probability density functions for the magnitude or for the, or for the focal mechanism. And uh, like uh, this uh, slide shows uh, some advantages, which basically 
we have considered the two cases, two use cases in this project. One was the North Czech case, another was the Samos earthquake. And uh, <clears throat> so basically, these advantages are the same, which I told you like before when talking about the Tohoku. So that uh, in case of Samos, for example, in the like smaller happy central distances, the stations were brought by the stations were clipped, but we could also use the Genesis stations at the time like uh, to start the process and there there was not a large number of genesis stations in case of norcia uh, eight years ago or also in summers but we just would like to show that they are there and they are working uh, also we have seen some problem also because we tried to use the classical uh, uh, seismological process in the software so we have treated dynamic waveforms. Also, Genesis was treated as a seismogram. And in that case, usually to uh, like estimate the moment tensor, you make a, a filtering, uh, like a frequency domain filtering of the Genesis, and you use the long uh, period records. But in these long period records, there is a lot of Genesis noise which is not of the seismic character, just like a noise coming from the atmosphere, from the ionosphere, the troposphere, and that makes this uh, like uh, uh, implication of the classical seismological tools uh, under the question. So basically, you should use another tools for Genesis processing, not just like uh, classical uh, seismological processing tools. So that was one of our also findings, which I also think important to note. And uh, finally, after we have uh, after we have the uh, source model, we can uh, calculate, for example, here the shake map. So basically, the shape map was generated in a synthetic way, and we use the two ways. First, we can compute it directly using the green functions and the source model, uh, calculate the synthetic waveforms, and then make a ground motion prediction. Uh, or then we can say it's slow enough, let's train the network and use this synthetic database to train the network and then make the ground motion prediction for, with the artificial intelligence way. And that was what is shown here. So basically, um, it uh, shows that we are like uh, that we can calculate the uh, ground shaking map from moment tensor or from the uh, extended source model and the comparison to the real data, which is shown with the uh, mu is a bias and sigma is uh, uncertainty is pretty good. And then we can take the network, uh, this data, train the network. Here are some parameters of the network. I don't have time to go into the details now. And uh, that's the comparison of the computed PVS and NN is the results from the network. And they basically the shake maps are basically the same, but here they they are the same. But if you look here on the speed up graph on the right hand side, that you can see that the network we basically the processing time is a few seconds for any magnitude from from five to seven point five. While for uh, simulations, of course, the larger magnitudes would uh, take more than two, uh, 100 seconds to simulate. So the speed up for the new, uh, new neural network, of course, is enormous, which makes it also good for the applications. And the last advantage, what I want to show you, is basically that we have not only shake map, we have a distribution. It's basically it's Bayesian approach, so that in each point, in each point, in each pixel, we basically have a picture like, like you see he, here on the bottom. It's not one value of shake, and it's a distribution of the PJs. It's a probability density function for that. Okay, so I finish uh, here. Just would like to show that all this software, which was developed in the course of the project, was it's open source. It's placed at the GFZ repository. Uh, there is some uh, documentation. There is a playbacks for the Norcia, for the Samos, which could be also um, uh, used for the uh, demonstration. And with that, I would like to, uh, to thank you for your attention. And I'm ready for your questions. Thank you.
Thank you very much, uh, Andre, for the excellent presentation. Uh, on, and I'm very happy to see the progress that has been made in this project that uh, we started together a few years ago. I'm not uh, involved anymore in this project, but I'm really very happy uh, for the progress, which is really excellent and uh, quite promising. Um, I, I would like to give the, the, the floor to the audience for possible questions that may have. Uh, is there any question from, uh, from the participants of this session? Okay, uh, yes. Uh, Mrs. Katerina Kacaciadu. Because of the noise, uh, the high noise level uh, goes very close to maybe? Mm. Uh, okay. Gerasimus, could you please uh, be, be, uh, yes, help me? Be Repeat it in the microphone, quite interesting uh, question, according to my understanding. Uh, you said that uh, we have a, a high noise level, uh, in uh, the question is, uh, because of that, did we have any false alarm? I, it's still, it's, I, I could hear Gerasimus very well, but Katerina, not you, I don't know what, what's... Uh... Yeah. Is the, it the, 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 the question is that uh, if some of the records are of high noise level, uh, may may uh, affect the, 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 the final result and cause uh, possible false alarm if an application is going to take place in the future. So basically, that the question of noise was really uh, like the principal question, of course, because accuracy of GNSS is like uh, is uh, now it's like what I showed you is about like one centimeter, yeah. So it's for the uh, for the derivation, and uh, then uh, you uh, you have idea about this noise that there is some uh, noise, and when you make inversion into the source you somehow account for this noise in your source model. So your source model and means then the prediction which you make from this model is not just like one number. It's uh, like what we try to do. It's, it, it, it is also the concept of the uh, probabilistic tsunami forecasting. When we provide the best prediction, but also say the sigma, so the range of the possible uh, uh, wave heights. And uh, then we believe that, of course, then the decision makers, uh, uh, they should see this uncertainty, evaluate this uncertainty, and then make a decision, uh, uh, like about the how to project this result into the action. So this projection of the result, yeah, of also of a noisy result, so uh, to the action, is uh, uh, is uh, 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 it's like what what science can do? Science can give you say give us the best possible uh, information about what is happening and what is the prediction, yeah, and uh, in the best way also to uh, to communicate the uncertainty in a fair way. But then the decision about how to deal with this uncertainty, uh, it, it is uh, kind of should be done, I, I believe, in joint decision between the science and the decision making. So that uh, I don't have the very clear answer. But I, what I want to say that we are living in the world of uncertainty and uh, we should in a fair way assess this uncertainty, understand it, and then make a decision based on that. Okay, Andre, thank you very much. One more question from Ioana Trianda Filu. Hi, Andre. Hi. Thank you very much for the great presentation. I would like to ask you uh, if the network, GNSS network in Greece, is quite a good way uh, for this methodology. Thank you. Uh, Joanna, I just missed the 
last part of your question is the network in in greece what is if it is adequate for a uh, real time uh, application um Yes, yeah, so, uh, what I mentioned, like, I don't know about the whole network, but but that part of the network, uh, which is uh, which work uh, like I know that there is a strong cooperation uh, between um, Antonio Valone, which is running this ring, and uh, Costas uh, Jose Anitis, who who is uh, running this Noah, and uh, we were considering all the stations which you can see just now here on this slide on the. Uh, on the left, on the western side, yeah, uh, on the western side, which are uh, close to the uh, to the Hellenic uh, uh, to the western Hellenic arc, like Anki Station, for example. I I, I do remember we discussed and talked uh, this Anki Station, uh, uh, Kita uh, Ktia Station was mentioned at that time. Uh, so uh, these stations should be able to uh, to uh, to operate uh, uh, to operate in the like in the um, yes in the real time in for our use cases we use Norcia case and the stations which are there in the central Italy and uh, also the, uh, for the Samos case we took the stations from the uh, Turkish colleagues uh, but we did not consider the use cases. Uh, we plan to have a synthetic earthquake uh, here in the Western Hellenic Arc, but uh, did not uh, did not progress to that stage. So that uh, yes, so like uh, uh, to your question, Joanna, I think that uh, because of this of the strong cooperation between Ring and Noonet, uh, that uh, should be no question at all. Yeah. Well, thank you very much, uh, Andrea. I'm very sorry we have no uh, more time for discussion, although it is quite challenging, promising, and very interesting. Uh, thank you very much uh, once more for your contribution uh, with your excellent presentation. Thank you. Good morning. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much for your interest and uh, for your attention. And yeah. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.